If you want to support independent content like this show, the PlayStation Podcast Sacred Symbols, the Retro Podcast Knockback, and more, and get perks for doing so, please consider subscribing to Collins Last Stand on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Your support is essential. Thank you. If you've been keeping up on gaming news as of late, then chances are you've seen the Entertainment Software Association, or ESA, pop up quite a few times. From a public doxing incident this past August that revealed the information of over 2,000 journalists and influencers, to a series of leaked slides that shine a light on seemingly cringe-inducing plans for next year's E3, the ESA hasn't had a great year, to say the least. But while lots of people know the ESA name, many gamers don't know much of anything about what the ESA actually does and its role within the gaming sphere. But fear not, because this episode of SideQuest aims to be educational. A quick summation of the ESA is that it's a trade organization based in the American capital city of Washington, D.C., and its membership constitutes a who's who of gaming publishers and powerhouses. Today, its role of members is comprised of 35 companies, including, but not limited to, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, Bungie, Activision, Konami, Tencent, and Ubisoft. For those not in the know, a trade organization is essentially a lobbying group dedicated to a particular industry to try and extract positive governmental, economic, and societal outcomes for whoever it happens to represent. They twist arms in Congress, spend money on campaigns, and generally act in their own self-interest, and that of their industry. According to the ESA itself, the organization serves, quote, as the voice and advocate for the video game industry. Our mission is to expand and protect the dynamic worldwide marketplace for video games, end quote. What this means, as further laid out on its website, is that it advocates for the enforcement of intellectual property protection, lobbies Congress for less regulation when it comes to digital trade and services, helps members promote not only games generally, but their positive impacts on society widely, and assists members in navigating various laws and regulations. In a 1997 interview with Next Generation magazine, the ESA's first president, Doug Lowenstein, spelled things out even further, especially as it pertains to the organization's anti-piracy measures. As he would elaborate, the entire industry was losing $3 billion per year thanks to global piracy, a number that has surely only gone up significantly in the last 20 plus years, as the internet not only continues to grow in ubiquity, but makes piracy even easier. Due to this, the ESA, then going by the acronym IDSA, more on that in a minute, put together a multifaceted program to protect the intellectual rights of its members. As Lowenstein would explain, quote, this program includes public policy advocacy here in the U.S. with the U.S. government, active investigation and enforcement efforts in specific countries where we have identified particularly acute problems for our business, training and education of U.S. customs officials and law enforcement officials, working with foreign government directly and with third parties to include adoption of effective intellectual property regimes, and it includes an online enforcement initiative to try and make some headway in the growing problem of internet piracy, end quote. Within that same interview, Lowenstein speaks out about some of the group's other lobbying efforts, because again, at its core, the ESA is a lobbying organization, or as Next Generation Magazine would so aptly put it, quote, the ESA handles pretty much all of the game industry's dealings with angry politicians, organizes and runs E3, fights software piracy, supports political campaigns that help video gaming, and opposes those that don't, end quote. On top of all of that, it developed the Entertainment Software Ratings Board. The ESA's role as a whole, and its hand in the development of the ESRB, was very much bred out of necessity, as the organization was created to stymie controversies which beat down the industry's doors in the first half of the 1990s. Around this time, Connecticut's Democratic-turned-independent Senator Joe Lieberman was on a moral crusade. Previous years had seen a rise in video games featuring graphic violence and even sexual content, and a predictable moral panic ensued about what potential harm this was causing children. Custer's Revenge saw the rape of a Native American. Moral Combat featured gruesome fatalities. Night Trap was rife with sexualization and murder. Leisure Suit Larry was all about getting laid, and a bevy of other titles hosted content that parents and lawmakers found all too disturbing. We take the ESRB and its international facsimiles for granted today, but in the early 90s there was no unified rating system, and because of this, games didn't carry with them age limits, like films did and still do. Some companies like Nintendo had strict unilateral policies, and content they deemed unfit for a family console was denied access to their coveted hardware. Or, at best, such games were heavily edited, as anyone with the Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat can attest. Due to congressional hearings on the matter, a few ratings boards would crop up, most notably Sega's Video Game Rating Council, but Capitol Hill wasn't impressed, 
and the industry was facing government regulation if the medium couldn't come up with a solution on its own. The proposal to develop an in-house and industry-wide rating system sounds simpler than it is, because at this time, Sega and Nintendo were in the midst of a hellacious console war, and they often resorted to blaming the other for the industry's woes. Then Nintendo chairman Howard Lincoln even criticized the Sega CD in front of Congress by expressing that Night Trap, a game published on the platform, had, quote, no place in our society, end quote. This game, which as you've indicate, indicated, promotes violence against women, simply has no place in our society. In response, Sega Vice President Bill White described themselves as responsible because his company maintained the previously mentioned Sega-centric video game rating council. Given that the video game industry's various corporate players were endlessly arguing with each other and sensing that they'd be unable to come up with a new unified rating system on their own, or possibly because he expected them to take a governmental threat more seriously, Joe Lieberman proposed the Video Game Ratings Act of 1994. At the time, it was made clear that the bill would die by committee if the industry could come together with its own solution, and for better or worse, that's exactly what they did. In April of 1994, the major publishers and console makers formed the Interactive Digital Software Association. This is what we now know as the ESA, a name change that occurred back in 2003. Some of the original members were Sega, Nintendo, 3DO, Atari, and Electronic Arts. Along with the formation of the IDSA, the group created the ESRB and the various ratings that accompany it. Around this same time, a few heavy hitters began dreaming of a new trade show designed entirely around gaming. Many within the industry were unhappy with events such as the Consumer Electronics Show, and they wanted something of their own. Publishers were spending large sums of cash for a spot at CES, but the event didn't have much respect for gaming. As Sega CEO Tom Kalinske would reminisce, quote, The CES organizers used to put the video game industry way, way in the back. In 1991, they put us in a tent, and you had to walk past all the porn vendors to find us. That year, it was pouring rain, and the rain leaked right over our new Genesis system. I was just furious with the way CES treated the video game industry, and I felt we were a more important industry than they were giving us credit for." End quote. The idea of a show aimed specifically at the gaming medium can actually be attributed to Pat Farrell, the founder of GamePro Magazine. He got in touch with important people within the industry and found success when he touched base with Bing Gordon of Electronic Arts. GamePro was actually a subsidiary of the International Data Group, and the IDG had experience running various events around the world. They then approached the IDSA as it was determined they needed ties to the group to really succeed, and voila, E3 was born. This is of course glossing over other events, as there was a lot of drama behind the scenes, but we'll leave that for another episode of SideQuest so we don't lose the plot. Back to the topic at hand, E3 ended up becoming an almost immediate success, and while it has finally begun to stumble in recent years and looks closer to death than ever, it still left a huge impact on gaming, and provided the ESA with a lot of influence and funding. As Doug Lowenstein would express in 1997, E3 was the IDSA's primary source of income. So successful was the venture for them that they would ultimately strike up a deal with the IDG and take sole ownership of E3 and its intellectual properties. Today, E3 reportedly accounts for roughly half of ESA's income. As the 20th century began waning, the ESA would spend large sums of money on its lobbying efforts. According to OpenSecrets.org, its first years of lobbying seemed relatively tame, with only $180,000 and $360,000 spent in 1998 and 1999, respectively. But from the year 2000 on, spending grew at a mighty pace. By 2001, the group was doling out more than a million dollars a year, and with the exception of a couple of odd years here and there, they eventually moved into sums of $5 million or more, an amount that peaked in 2016 with nearly $7 million spent on various endeavors and initiatives. In 2019 alone, the ESA has lobbied for immigration reform, consumer product safety, taxes, and more. Whether what it lobbies for is considered good or bad will probably depend on your personal politics, but it has certainly taken some controversial stances, especially more recently. In 2011, two highly unpopular bills came before Congress. Congress. One was the Stop Online Piracy Act, and the other was the Protect IP Act, or as they're more commonly known, SOPA and PIPA. These two bills created a firestorm, and they would, in many people's eyes, infringe on online freedom of speech. A major complaint was that they would give the government the ability to shut down websites it suspected of housing copyrighted content, a directive which could easily be nefariously manipulated. Now obviously, many websites exist with the sole purpose of distributing pirated goods, and it makes perfect sense why they should be targeted, but the language of the bills was much too loose, and the legislation went too far. One quick example is that SOPA would have given the State Department the power to block an entire website without due process, a serious constitutional infringement in America. And in the confusing and fluid environment that is fair use versus copyright infringement, no single entity should wield the power to decide what's what, especially outside the realm of the courts. Given the far-reaching implication of these bills, countless companies and websites took a stand. Reddit went dark for a day, Wired censored headlines on its front page, Google blacked out its logo, 
and other sites formed many protests of their own. Yet, to the detriment of many, the ESA supported the bills. This was essentially the game industry taking a stand for a draconian set of laws that, if passed, would have changed the entire internet as we know it, and people were pissed. The backlash was so strong that in late January of 2012, the ESA officially dropped its support of SOPA and PIPA. Though, and take this as you will, it dropped its support after Congress announced it would indefinitely delay voting on the bills. So it could have been, and probably was, a face-saving maneuver, and nothing more. While its role in SOPA and PIPA was to the detriment of most, not all public opinion was bad for the ESA, as it was also around this period that they helped win a landmark case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Known as Brown vs. the Entertainment Merchants Association, this was a case that led to a ruling striking down a 2005 California law that would have banned the sale of violent games to those younger than 18, a statute that negated the ESRB's own rating of Mature 17+. As Michael Gallagher, the man who ran the ESA after Doug Lowenstein stepped down in 2006, expressed, quote, The court declared forcefully that content-based restrictions on games are unconstitutional, and that parents, not government bureaucrats, have the right to decide what is appropriate for their children, end quote. The Supreme Court win was a big deal for the ESA, and it gave them massive bragging rights as it could declare it stood for free speech, something currently touted on its own website. Though, as usual, this high wasn't meant to last, as the aforementioned SOPA slash PIPA support hurt their public image, as did a series of blunders that occurred as the years passed, the most galling of which was the 2019 E3 data leak. As reported on first by CLS's very own freelance writer, Sophia Narwitz, the E3 data leak was a public doxing incident that revealed the sensitive details of over 2,000 journalists, streamers, media influencers, and more. An unsecured area of the ESA's E3 website held a file that was sitting out in the open, and it contained home addresses, private phone numbers, emails, and names of almost everyone who attended E3 with special access privileges. The file had been freely available for months on a portion of the website simply titled Helpful Links, where another link labeled Registered Media List sat between other resources. Upon clicking the link, a file was automatically downloaded, and voila, no password was necessary and no other security efforts were in place. After the news broke, other publications would learn that the data of previous year's attendees had been freely available online too. As of this video's recording, the media master lists from 2019, 2018, 2006, and 2004 have all been discovered online. Putting the ESA under an even harsher light is that they had been warned several times over the course of the year that the 2018 and 2019 lists were open to the public, and they did nothing about it. How this occurred is potentially due to a series of shakeups behind the scenes at the ESA. In 2018, Mike Gallagher stepped down as president, and Stanley Pierre Louis was named his interim replacement. Pierre Louis would eventually come to hold the position permanently, and if media reports are to be believed, the situation at the organization is still quite ugly. As Brian Crescente wrote in Variety this past spring, Mike Gallagher's departure left the ESA in disarray. As anonymous employees told the publication, the lobbyist group is now, quote, a toxic environment rife with internal politics, witch hunts, and infighting, end quote. As of Crescente's reporting, half of the association's leadership has quit or been fired. Adding to their woes are that members are displeased with the organization and the current state of E3. This is especially important, as again, much of the ESA's income comes from membership dues from publishers ranging from Square Enix and Activision to THQ Nordic and Ubisoft. The rest of it comes from E3. If the publishers aren't happy and if they bail out, then it's game over for the ESA. The sad state of its annual E3 convention, along with the more recent aforementioned doxing, has understandably caused those within games media to be hesitant about attending next year's E3. The annual show has already been struggling in recent years, with some massive corporations, such as Sony, deciding it's not even worth attending at all. And with the internet now reaching into every aspect of our lives, these same companies are alert to the fact that wasting untold sums of money for a spot at the LA Convention Center may not be worth it, when they can easily beam digestible press conferences to our phones or go to other shows that are scattered throughout the year as necessary. Possibly sensing that E3 is on life support, the ESA has proposed changes to next year's event, and if what's been leaked is any indication, they have no idea what they're doing. One proposal is to have NBA players play basketball with popular influencers. Remember, this is a video game-centric trade show. The organization even coined a cringe-inducing term called cutainment, which would serve as a means of keeping guests entertained as they wait in line for access to so-called experience hubs that litter the convention floor. As GamesDaily.biz would report, quote, None of this fixes the core problem. Publishers, ESA's members, don't need the LA Convention Center to reach media and influencers. They don't need one week when the entire year includes media events and consumer conventions. E3 can still have value, but as the ESA continues to push the event toward a consumer focus, it is in conflict with the majority of members that do not want it to yet be another event for players. This is an identity crisis that cutainment and celebrities aren't going to fix." End quote. One can't say for sure what the future of E3 is, but it isn't looking too bright. As for the ESA, who knows? I'm not even sure they know. 
Throughout its existence, members have occasionally dropped in and out, but the organization still has the backing of the largest publishers in the world, and it's still a gigantic lobbying group with lots of influence and power, so it's not going to be disappearing anytime soon. The loss of E3 would no doubt hurt the ESA's income to a devastating level, so we'll probably see yet even more absurd proposals as the next few years rage on.